all. Welcome to week six. As you continue to work on your group's Project 3 presentation, we're going to read and talk a bit this week about the implications of social entrepreneurship. And we've been reading and talking about impact and implications all semester long. Last summer, the city of Lansing allocated $140,000 to help fund arts-based projects and programs in Lansing neighborhoods and communities. The mayor argued how critical it was to fund creatives and artists and arts organizations and said, a strong investment in arts and culture is key to our economy in today's world. So in this video, before I talk about our week six readings, cases and sparks, and a bit about project four, our final class project, I wanna share an example of an arts-based cultural entrepreneurship initiative in a neighborhood in Lansing. We've talked about cultural entrepreneurship in class so far. Cultural entrepreneurship is the act of applying entrepreneurial approaches specifically to leverage arts and cultural resources to ideally shape and even shift cultural beliefs. And in this case, potentially better economically leverage and situate a neighborhood. For years in Lansing, Michigan, the Deluxe Inn sat at the intersection of 496 and Washington Avenue, which is just a couple blocks north of where I live in Lansing. And the Deluxe Inn was about five blocks south from the state capitol building. It essentially served as a geographic and visual entry from the capital area into Rio Town, or R.E. Oldstown, a neighborhood in Lansing that housed an Oldsmobile plant till the 1970s, and now houses a 2.5 million square foot GM facility on 111 acres that runs a two-shift operation and produces the Cadillac, CTS, and ATS. The plant is absolutely huge and runs along the Grand River, as you can see on this satellite image and on this map. This map shows the entire area of the facility. The blank spaces are where buildings stood until a few years ago. Then the owners demoed several old buildings and cleared out the area. The entire west side of the plant is now essentially a parking lot. Sometimes it's used to store cars post assembly before they're trucked out. Other times it sits empty. Not all of the other buildings on the property are used. This building, for instance, is ghost office space. It was once administrative offices for the plant, but some of the windows are broken, and you can see tarp-covered desks and boxes and office machines. Um, about three years ago, GM wrapped the building, turning it into an eight-story, 360-degree billboard for the Cadillac ATS made at the plant in the operational buildings. Back to the Deluxe Inn. The Deluxe Inn, which is right across the street and adjacent from the f factory facility, is a landmark in the neighborhood, or was a landmark in the neighborhood. The Deluxe Inn was a problem spot with almost one 911 call per day in 2004. In 2006, the city launched a case to shut it down after more than a dozen arrests happened within two months. Most of the people who lived there were full-time residents, and it was known as a location for drugs and prostitution. One Lansing area reporter suggested that the Deluxe Inn put the hoe in hotel. The city finally shut down the Deluxe Inn for non-payment of back taxes in 2009 and worked to relocate the tenants. The city land bank purchased the building and the grounds for $400,000, and it sat boarded up for over a year. Then... In 2010, Sam DeBourbon, a.k.a. AKA Samski, a local Lansing kid, was arrested for destruction of property, tagging under a railway overpass on a wall that was actually demolished soon after. Sam still wound up in front of a judge, and he argued for community service and told the judge about an idea he had about a public art project, and he was looking at the deluxe in property. Joe Manzella, a Lansing area mover and shaker and entrepreneur, worked at the time for Accelerate Lansing, and he got on board. He pulled in Eric Schritzing, Ingham County Treasurer and Director of the Ingham County Land Bank, which owned the Deluxe Inn property. Sam launched the project and invited artists from Chicago, Detroit, New York, and L.A. In August 2010, the artists began work, and what started as an invite-only project became more. Sam was there every day, encouraging people to bring their own 
paint, chatting with people, complimenting people's work. On one of the days I stopped by, Oyster, a fairly well-known Chicago graffiti artist, was working above an MSU prof who came armed with at least a dozen cans of spray paint. Two middle schoolers were tagging up on the second floor of the abandoned motel. A kid from Korea who is attending Cooley Law School was working on a piece. And painting began with little scrawls and tags and expanded from there. Some of the work took up a few inches. Some of the work took up feet of space and span from the ground to the roof overhang. Some of the work was aesthetic. Some was activist or political. Some was place-based and pride-based. At the end of the week, all of the walls, doors, entryways, stairways, sidewalks, curbs, and parking lot were covered. Schertzing, who, again, was the Ingham County treasurer, said, the community created the event. We just provided the palette. Joe Manzella commented that if you take the arts and you wed them to a place, you create a space where people want to be. The graffiti project stood for about a month. And then the city used the property to conduct a fire test and burnt the buildings to the ground. The only thing left on the property now, years later, is a lone pine tree that a neighborhood woman asked be preserved and a sign announcing Rio Town. Before the fire department descended on the property, a handful of people from Rio Town salvaged what they could, pulling panels off of walls, cutting concrete, hauling it off. There were a couple of gallery shows in the months after the Luxon Graffiti Project, mainly featuring photographs people took during the graffiti art project. Since the art project, the Rio Town Business Board has commissioned artists to paint an empty wall in a lot where a business stood for years before it burned down a few years ago, and to produce more graffiti projects along the Rio Town corridor. Some of this salvaged art has reappeared as picnic tables and planters along the Rio Town corridor. The graffiti has been part of the artistic, aesthetic, and historical space of Rio Town, and it served as a cultural entrepreneurial catalyst for the community. One of the pieces still standing in Rio Town includes this, Build 517, 517 being the Lansing area, area code. This is what I think the Deluxe and Graffiti Project and Rio Town's life after has done. It served as a call to build specifically this neighborhood. I don't think the graffiti made all the changes happen, but the change in Rio Town over the last few years has been incredible. There's a new church along the corridor, several new restaurants, a new coffee shop. Blue Owl just opened a few months ago. There are several medical marijuana dispensaries. Rio Town is a bustling area of activity and commerce now, surrounded by bright colored walls. I would argue that Rio Town is an example of cultural entrepreneurship that some key movers and shakers saw the potential of the area and how public art could influence the identity of the area and enhance the entrepreneurial community. For this week, we're going to start our readings on impact and implications with a piece by Katie Milway, where she describes how social entrepreneurs can have the most impact in their communities and with the people they're trying to reach. We'll also read a piece by Allison Moore called Entrepreneurs Who Want to Make a Social Impact. And it's about movers and shakers here in Lansing. And the piece um, includes a brief interview with Paul Jakes, who's the director of Spartan Innovations and runs The Hatch, a space I've talked about earlier in class. Our third reading is by an organization called Impact Boom, and it's actually a podcast. And it's a podcast summarizing the fundamental ingredients of successful entrepreneurs. So you can listen to the podcast, or you can read the transcript of the podcast, which is also available through D2L. Our case for this week is This Bar Saves Lives, a project and product launched by an MSU alum that has had a pretty significant impact on child malnourishment and world hunger. All three of this week's sparks offer principles and ideas for you to consider as you work on project three. Our first spark is a set of ideas, templates, theories, and examples about creating spaces for creativity, collaboration, and ideally social entrepreneurial work. Our second spark is a brief piece about a creative house built to facilitate creativity, collaboration, and entrepreneurial projects. And our third spark is a piece that showcases the workspaces of 40 famously creative people.
I think these sparks will offer you some good material to talk about with your creativity cluster and potentially some examples and ideas to include in your Project 3 presentations. Your group's Project 3 presentations are due this Sunday, June 24th, uploaded to D2L by noon Eastern. Please identify someone in your group who's going to be responsible for uploading your group's final presentation and final Project 3 work. And then each of you will be individually submitting your reflective work all in the same folder. I know you're in the midst of Project 3, but next week, week 7, is our last week of class. And your last class project, Project 4, which is a short essay, is due on Friday. Friday, June 29th by noon Eastern. Not Sunday, Friday, because that's our last day of class. For Project 4, you're going to work individually. And again, the product is a short essay. I'm going to ask that you focus on a community and focus in on a particular need in that community. Then you're going to pitch a social, entrepreneurial, fix, approach, or remedy to address that need. You can get to the full Project 4 assignment on D2L now. And if you scroll past the assignment itself, you'll see there are two example essays, both of which received an A, and both of which I think are really good models of the type of approach you might take and the type of essay you might produce. As always, if you have any questions or concerns about our week six readings, cases, sparks, or your reading response for week six, do posted by this Friday midnight on our shared Google Drive folder. Let me know. If you have any questions, issues, concerns about Project 3 and wrapping up and submitting your group's work, please feel free to reach out individually or as a group with any questions you have.